for us here is that this is a human being that was born and died. A human being. And as you sit here hearing my words now, I invite you to sense into your own humanity, your own f fleshy, worldly life. And perhaps in hearing my voice, you can hear my humanity in the texture of my voice. You can see my humanity on my face, you know, just a person, just a man. And the reason this means so much is that it's so easy for uh, the myth of the Buddha to take over, to create distance between that life and this life that you and I live. And if that distance is created, then there's also distance between ourselves and awakening, like what that would mean to waken, awaken as a human being not as a myth, as a story. So even as you sit here now, for example, uh, just feeling the shape of your body, uh, you could even, I'd like to invite you to just maybe move your hands, wiggle your fingers, and feel the, you know, the, the embodiment and say, oh, what is knowing this body? What is knowing these fingers? And just pause for a moment and observe your own mind. Is the mind that you're observing capable of awakening from confusion, awakening from the pressure of always having to become something? You know, when the Buddha You know, the reports that we hear of the Buddha's life, quite remarkable. Many, you know, with gods and devas and mind reading of, you know, understanding people's minds without them saying anything. All these special things that <sighs> over 2,000 years and different Buddhist religions became something quite spectacular, something very elaborate. Like walking into a temple and seeing all of the bright gold painted altars and the beautiful statues and fancy things. <laughs> but any of us, we look at our lives and what we see is tables and food and bathrooms and cars and subways. This is what we see. Fortunately, we can cut through that. We can say, that's lovely, but what does it mean to me? And we cut through it. 
And honestly, the Buddha, all he wanted to do was cut through it. He said, what I'm teaching is suffering and the end of suffering. Suffering and the end of suffering. Everything else is commentary. Everything else is method and encouragement and some insights to help us recognize the nature of suffering and how to let go. But the essence is that peace, the Buddha was born into a body, his body hurt too, just like your body sometimes hurts. He had a sore back. When he walked on the ground, his feet touched rocks and you know, sharp things. When he talked about suffering, he was talking about flies and mosquitoes and he was talking about snakes and but he was also talking about hunger and he was talking about death and he was talking about being separated from what you love does any of that sound familiar And we look around at the world now with all of the enormous political suffering, economic suffering, it seems like how can the Dhamma come into this? And so Vesak Day is a time to remember the humanity of the teachings and the awakening both at the same time, the humanity and the awakening. The problem of suffering that the Buddha spoke about, the dukkha, the suffering, is the suffering that comes when the hungry mind, the mind, the heart, that is always needing more, wanting more, looking for more pleasure, looking to stay away from pain, always trying to get the world right, causes us to grasp at things, hold on to them and try to control the world, try to get it the way we want. That's where the suffering is. In the holding and the hunger and the uh, constant push that that creates. And that is where we can be free. We cannot change death. We cannot change aging. We can't change even subways and buses that are late. And we can't change the person we work for who is difficult. And we can't change problems in the world except by being good, by sila. But we can't get rid of dictators and injustice and climate change. We can change our minds. And it's the hunger and the grasping. That's the key. When we meditate, we can see the mind. It's crazy, right? The mind, your mind, my mind, crazy just busy and full and wanting and not wanting. This is what can change. We meditate, we not only see it, 
but we learn to relate to the wanting without falling into it and becoming I want. We know there's wanting. It's a habit. We were born with it. We keep growing it as we grow up from little children more and more and more. Or the not wanting and the fear life is scary. Okay, it's still scary, but we can know the fear. This is where right here in the knowing there can be the letting go. Meditation is a training in letting go. And when we meditate with another person, we not only see the hungers for sensory desire or the fear of death, we see the hunger for relationship desire and we see the fear of loss or the fear of people seeing us and the things that we might not see when we meditate alone and in silence. But the process of knowing and accepting, meeting experience and learning bit by bit what it's like to release, to meet and not back away from the suffering, not say, oh, it's not there. I'm just going to meditate and not see it. And we learn to meditate perhaps to protect ourselves, to get out. No, that's not awakening. <laughs> that's what the Buddha called pleasant abiding here and now. <laughs> that's not awakening. Awakening is knowing things as they actually are and how to meet that. In Insight Dialogue, the meditation instruction pause is exactly the awareness waking up to what is present in the body-mind, in the relational experience, what is present now. Pause. So when we stop talking or in our listening, when we let go and take a break from the mind going off and pause and we come home to this moment, meditation is happening even though there's talking and listening and we meet experience. Pause. And when we meet experience, sometimes it will be lovely. Sometimes it will not be lovely. Same as life. So pause, relax. Relax invites us to accept and receive however it is. So if I see distress in my mind or if what's happening in relationship or in my group is awkward, pause and there's clear seeing, there's mindfulness, mindfulness, pause, relax. And it's accepted. We Awareness lets it in. It, like here's the awareness, here's what can be known Instead of just touching, it's like we let it in. We can know the experience, receive and allow it to be just as it is. Not push away, not grab. Pause, relax. And it's not just practicing alone. We're with another, we're with each other. There's two of us, there's three of us, sometimes more, four, five, even this whole group, you can learn to let the mind be wide and for mindfulness to be established internally. So I know this body, I know this mind. Externally, B 
being aware of the other, of the whole group, and to be aware internally and externally, both, which is exactly how the Buddha taught mindfulness. This is straight out of the discourses. Mindfulness internally, externally, and both. So I'm going to invite us now into a contemplation. And it's this, you might say, let's make it our, our own Vesak day, our own day of our humanity, being born into our humanity. Feel your body as I'm speaking, perhaps. Just like this, I'm feeling mine. Birth, being born. And the actual nature of this life with its, with its dukkha. Is there sensing, do you sense in the moment that you pause the humanity suffering and the possibility for awakening. Do you sense the humanity with all of its complexity? However your specific life is, each one of you has a rich, complex life. Every one of you and me, we all do. So we recognize that. Can you sense that humanity and the potential for awakening, for not falling in, for knowing, meeting, and not falling in. Pause, relax, open. Let your practice support you. It's a kind of a refuge. It's a protection. It lets you see what's difficult and beautiful and remain present. Remain present internally and externally and in relationship. Pause, relax. Each of the three of you will have First, four minutes, and then you'll have six minutes of all three of you together of releasing the form. So when you first come into the room, the breakout room, decide who will speak first, second, and third, and then pause there before you begin, settle, and enter this question, enter this here and now question of sensing your own humanity with all its dukkha, all its beauty, everything. Do you sense also the possibility of awakening? Does that inspire you? Does that feel possible? any insight, just let it in. Pause, relax. Thank you. I'll share another contemplation so you'll go back to your group. And there will be no need to take turns. Just as soon as you get there, all together, you can pause and enter into 
the practice together. If we look at how our minds actually are, and if we look at how our lives are so full and constantly reinforcing the speed, the desire, the fear. We can see that a path that is only special practices, only retreats, only formal sitting is not enough. In fact, even if our mindfulness were very good, that's not enough. <laughs> the path has so many aspects, aspects of morality, of giving, aspects of samadhi, of concentration, gathering the mind, aspects of investigation, study, reflection. aspects of being um, with others in acts of compassion and care. So the whole of our lives, nothing left out, that's the path. Because every moment, even as you hear these words from me, every moment, the mind is constantly rebuilding, reforming all the constructs of I am, all the constructs of ignorance and wanting. So each moment is part of can the mind, can we on our path invite the freedom right here, always, in the kitchen, at work, with our families, on the street, nothing left out. So the contemplation is both, do you sense the need for this intentional turning of your life and does a whole life path feel possible? Whatever it looks like, does it feel, uh, is it calling you? Or do you want to stay insane? That's sort of the other side. <laughs> suffering and the end of suffering. So you're joining together, not knowing who's going to speak, what's going to be said. I hope you enjoy the not knowing. Pause. Relax. Okay. Yeah, so just to just to close um the insight dialogue practice the inspiration that we can take into our lives from Vesak includes this sense of uh, our humanity 
to recognize the Buddha's humanity, to recognize the humanity of all of the lineage of teachers and the whole lineage of practitioners. Because it lets us know, I mean, life is like this for everyone. And we can be insane or we can at least be less insane and maybe we can even live a life of uh, balance and wisdom and care. It's possible, right? And if it weren't humanly possible, do you think the Buddha and all these other monks and nuns and practitioners over these years would bother to do all this work to protect the practices and to protect the Dhamma? No, it wouldn't. Why, why, why should they? So there's a kind of a reality that comes, but also confidence that comes with that. So uh, let's leave some space now for all of us to, um, if you feel moved to speak, the translators will support us in ha having me understand and other English speakers understand what's being said. Uh, if it's in Chinese, if it's in English, the translator will translate so that people who speak only Chinese can understand. So we'll do our best now to open the space uh, for all of us. So feel free to unmute yourself. And if you care to share what you discover in this moment, please. <laughs> 